looking at a queen, it's impossible to tell exactly her qualities. Okay? But it's, we know it's very, very important that the colonies be headed up by an excellent queen. And as uh, Roger indicated to you, ideally we would like to see those queens live two to three years, two years at a minimum. And back 50 plus years ago when I first got started in beekeeping, that was common. Uh, there are records of, of queens living up to six years. But now we're talking in months in, in many, many instances. And, and so we, we need to try to figure out what is going on here. The characteristics of your colony are related to the queen and the drones that she has mated with, okay? And so when we fail to get strong, productive colonies, as we've described in, in previous lectures, <coughs> then there is something wrong. And Roger has pointed out many different characteristics that are indicating that something is wrong. From my lecture, uh, I guess it was two days ago, uh, we said that when, when you see queen cells, that tells you that something isn't right, okay? In other words, one of the functions of the pheromones of the queen is to inhibit the raising of queen cells. And so, as we indicated in, in that first lecture of mine, when you see queen cells, you need to say what is going on. Why are they producing queens? If, we, if I have a good queen, they are not to be producing queens. And so something is interfering with this inhibition factor of her queen uh, pheromone. As Roger indicated in his uh, lecture, normally we'd expect to find only a single queen uh, in a colony, but here we see one, as he showed, that has two queens uh, present. The queen has two basic functions in the biology of the colony. And first of all, uh, she is the egg layer. She's going to lay, and again, the literature is full of different numbers. I like to say she's going to lay between 1,000 and 1,500 eggs a, a day during the, the peak time uh, of the year. We also, as we pointed out in my first lecture, is she produces pheromones coming from several different glands. And it's the distribution of her pheromones from the licking of her body and distributing it through the, a behavior known as trophallaxis, as we described to you, that all the bees of the colony are, one, aware that there is a queen present, and secondly, how good she is just even though they may not have direct contact with her, it's all based on her pheromone uh, profile. As we talked about, you look at a queen, you can't tell how good a queen she is. Now in this particular instance, the basic behavior of the queen is she's examining a, a cell to see one, has it been cleaned satisfactorily and ready to receive an egg. But secondly, she is using her forelegs or her front legs to measure the diameter of the cell. Is this a cell that should receive a fertilized egg? In other words, a worker size cell. Or is it a cell that should receive an unfertilized egg, a drone size cell? And the way she determines, undoubtedly there may be some, some odors involved, but she also measures the diameter of the cell with her front legs. And there have been numerous experiments that have shown that if you cut off a leg or if you bandage a leg or if you tie the legs together or, or whatever, they're no longer able to measure the diameter of that cell and they begin making mistakes, laying the appropriate egg in the right uh, cell. But if she's allowed to measure and inspect the cell, 
then they rarely make mistakes. After she finds the cell to be acceptable, she backs in and proceeds to lay an egg. And as we indicated, I like to use the, the, the numbers of 1,000 to 1,500 eggs per day. And it's important. Roger indicated it. It's important. Every time that you go into a colony, you look for eggs. And I think, as I said in one of my previous lectures, when I go into the apiary with a, with a group of beginners, that's one of the first things that I teach them, is how can you see eggs in the bottom of those cells. That tells you there's been a queen there, a laying queen there, in the last three days. Now, this will vary from one location to another, but as a general pattern in the, the northern hemisphere is queens usually lay from about mid-January to October, sparingly in early spring. She, she may very well cut off earlier here under uh, English conditions, uh, but this is the typical pattern that we see in the majority of the United States. But when you look at southern Florida, you look at southern Texas, you look at southern California, etc., the queens lay year-round, okay? But in the more northern climates, they, they have a break in their egg-laying cycle. This pheromone of the queen is a blend of chemicals, numerous chemicals, and it's produced by many different glands, which we listed for you the other day. These pheromones, as we've pointed out, help regulate the division of labor in the colony and the organization of the colony. But it also regulates the raising of queen cells within the colony. And as we said, if, the, if they're raising queen cells, that tells you something is wrong with the queen's pheromone profile. As, as Roger has pointed out, in recent years, we've got numerous reports of poor queens that are superseded soon after they are installed within a colony. It may be a matter of a, a few weeks or maybe even a couple months and suddenly you find that the, the queen has been superseded. How can you determine if you have a good queen? As we said, you can't do it by just looking at her. As you see here, you really have to look at other characteristics. And as we pointed out again in a previous lecture, you need to look at the brood pattern, you need to consider the behavior of the queen on the combs, the temperament of the workers, as well as the production records of that particular uh, colony. But most importantly here is the brood pattern. We like to see a nice solid brood pattern, but as Roger pointed out in his, his previous lecture, many factors can ultimately give you uh, a scattered brood pattern, okay? It's not just the queen. Uh, it may be a, a large flow and not having adequate space. It may be a, a disease problem. It may be a mite problem. Uh, it may be a genetic problem. There are numerous things that can give you a spotty brood pattern. Here's another real nice uh, brood pattern that we would like to see uh, in our counties. But as as Roger pointed out in his lecture, if you only look at, at cat brood, things could be going haywire at this point in time. And if you only look at cat brood and not look for eggs, look for queen cells, etc., you're not going to be aware that, that something has, has gone wrong in the biology of the hive. This is what we mean by a scattered brood pattern. So there are many factors that affect the quality of the queen. The age of the larva when they are selected for queen rearing, the rearing conditions, the handling of queen cells, their mating success as they go out into the drone congregation areas. There are various diseases and, and various abnormalities that may uh, influence egg production and, and egg laying, and as I indicated, there are genetic problems. So there's all these basic biological factors that can affect the quality of the queen. But I suspect there are many other factors, as we're going to talk about today, that will affect the quality of the queen. And I'm just going to throw a couple out here. Uh, initially, viruses. 
We really do not understand the, the effect of viruses on the queen and we're getting more and more evidence all the time that this is part of the problem. Another problem is the miticides that we're using within our hives to control varroa mites. Numerous studies, and I'm going to be reviewing some of these in, in a few minutes, numerous studies have shown if either a queen or a drone comes in contact with combs that absor have absorbed some of the residues of the, of the miticides that are being used within the colony, it negatively, negatively affects the reproductive state of the queen and drones as well. Uh, ideally, we, we, we preach this within the states if you are raising queens, they should be raised in colonies on equipment that has not been treated with miticides because you are likely to affect the quality of, of the final queens. As we said, queens have been failing at an extremely high rate. Many report that over 50% of queens are being replaced within six months after their introduction in the hive. So supersedure is a major problem. Roger has pointed out many other problems uh, as well. Again, we have scientists in the, in the states that have been looking at this problem and trying to determine what is actually going on. And I'm just going to review a couple studies. Uh, this one was uh, completed by Pettis and published in 2016. And he found, he examined large numbers of queens. He found that there was an issue with sperm viability. They were going through a natural mating process. The queens were receiving semen but the semen that was stored within their spermatheca had a low sperm viability, okay? And we'll talk about what could cause that in a minute. In healthy colonies, typically they had somewhere around 85% uh, sperm viability. In the poor colonies, they had something around the 50% viability. Well, if half of the, of the sperm are, are no good, ineffective, have lost their viability, then, then this would re relate to, to mating problems uh, and the, the ability of the queen to lay large numbers of fertilized eggs. So what could be the source of low sperm viability? It's related to the drones that the queen has mated with. And as I've already indicated, miticides are believed to be a major factor. Drones coming in contact with residues or with miticides directly, there is a reduction in sperm viability. Uh, jokingly, when we, we talk about it, we say these drones are shooting blanks when they go out and, and, and mate, so to speak. All right, another possibility is temperature extremes during shipment. And this would be the case where you're purchasing queens, you're, in, you're importing queens. What were the conditions that these queens were exposed to while they were going through the postal system? Okay, uh, again, Jeff Pettis looked at it. Uh, a group at Penn State University has looked at it uh, back about probably 12 years ago. And the extremes that these queens are exposed to during shipment are unbelievable. And in, in case of, of Pettis' um, study, he found that the queens were exposed to temperatures between 46.4 and 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. These are mated queens being shipped it causes death in, in some of the semen that's stored within their spermatheca. So these are both possible, possible reasons why uh, we have low sperm viability 
uh, in the Queens. David Tarpey at North Carolina State University and a group of his colleagues have done extensive studies on this as well. Um, they obtained 80 queens from breeders in California. These were, were shipped to North Carolina and when, upon arrival they were, they were weighed. The width of their thorax was measured and you say, why would you measure the thorax? I'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, they looked at the, the volume of semen that was stored within the spermatheca. They looked at the viability of the semen from those queens. And through DNA analysis, they were able to determine how many different drones those particular queens had, had mated with. As they say, this was based on 80 queens. All right, what did they find? Well, the average sperm count stored within the spermatheca was 4.37 million sperm. Sperm viability was 83.7%, and they had mated with an average of 17 drones. These are all good numbers, okay? However, queen quality varied with physical characteristics not mating characteristics. In agriculture, we often promote the idea of culling, getting rid of poor individuals, small individuals. Sometimes in, in, in animals, we refer to them as runts, okay? So, it was the physical characteristics. It was the size of the, of the queens. It was the measurement of the, of the thorax, not only the weight of the queens, but the measurement of the thorax that indicated that there were problems. Now, as I said, I would explain why would you measure the thorax. Many different measurements are taken on queens, people evaluating queens, and there are strong correlations between some of these measurements even though it's the measurement, the width of the thorax, say, which seems kind of uh, not necessary, but there are strong correlations between queen quality and some of these physical measurements that they make on the queens. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a mating issue. In this case, it was a physical issue, which goes back to the idea of rearing conditions, nutrition, uh, etc. So the question I want you to ask yourself today, what makes a good queen? As we indicated previously, queens are produced under three basic conditions. Emergency queen cells, supersedure queen cells, and swarming queen cells. We expect if they're raised under the emergency conditions, they're going to be likely poor, whereas we're under supersedure conditions and swarming, you're going to end up with good queens. It's not always the case, but I'm saying this is uh, we're talking about it in, in generality. And here we have an emergency queen cell on, on the comb, as you see here, and, and Roger showed you many pictures of them. Here's a bar of queen cells. We want to consider the size of the queen cells, the width of the queen cells, the length of the queen cells, and we also want to consider how much sculpturing has occurred on the outer surface of the queen cells. The more sculpturing, we believe that's an indication of better care or more care during the rearing process. So the size, as I say, the volume of the, the, um, the cell as well as the sculpturing should be used in culling out poor cells, poor small cells. Now as a queen lays eggs, she controls the fertilization process by regulating the, re the release of spermatozoa as we've already discussed uh, as she was deciding which type of egg to lay. Her entire supply 
is limited to what she obtained during her mating flight or possibly mating flights before she starts laying eggs. So it's important that she dispenses them gradually. It's also important if we look at mating success that she stores a large volume of semen within her spermatheca. That determines then how many fertilized eggs she can lay over her lifetime. Several spermatozoa are apparently released each time the egg passes by the spermathecal duct and we do not know the actual depletion rate. But when she runs out of semen, then she can only lay unfertilized eggs and we begin seeing uh, uh, drones being raised in worker size cells, etc., as, as uh, Roger uh, described. I want to look at a couple other studies. Many, many studies have been done in regards to this, this idea of queen quality and, and what makes a, a, a good queen. The numbers here are higher than what we typically find. This particular study was done in Canada and published in 1991. And basically what they were showing is a one to two week old queen had 9.7 million sperm stored in her spermatheca. A one-year-old had 7.6. Uh, a two-year-old had 5.5. And a three-year-old had over 2 million. We indicate or recommend that, that any time a queen has less than 3 million sperm stored within her spermatheca, she's not going to be able to complete a full season. Now, Roger indicated that if you have good queens, try to keep them as long as you possibly can. And I, and I don't have a problem with that. But if you do requeen on a regular schedule in the States, our recommendation is you requeen once every two years. Well, that's, that, that you can do that because uh, even though these numbers are extremely high, you see the basic pattern. And typically, that she's going to have less than uh, 3 million sperm in her spermatheca after she has completed two full years uh, of laying fertilized eggs. Um, okay, what are the factors that affect her egg laying potential? There are genetic factors, and that could be a whole lecture in itself. There are her physiological condition, the quality and quantity of royal jelly that she's receiving from the nurse bees, the size of her ovary, and her mating success. All of these are going to affect her potential for egg laying. The actual number of eggs that she lays today or next week is going to depend on the size of the nurse bee population within the colony. It's going to depend on the brood nest temperature which typically would be 93 to 95 degrees, and whether or not there's fresh nectar and pollen uh, coming in. So first of all, we're going, we're going to consider it, the quality of the queen from the standpoint, what is her potential, and what is she actually doing at a given time under a given set of conditions. Significant correlations have been found between egg laying rate population size and honey production. I don't think I need to spend time on that to convince you of, of that. As we indicated, many, many researchers have taken all kinds of measurements on queens in an attempt to evaluate the queen relating to her body size or weight and other morphological characteristics. And they have found, they have found correlations between size or weight of the queen and egg production, size of the brood area, total colony population, as well as, as honey production. Um, what's the bottom line? Your biggest queens are likely to be your best queens and have the greatest potential of laying a high rate uh, of eggs. So they have found a correlation between queen weight and number of ovarials. These are the two ovaries of the queen. Notice that 
They're made up of tubes. These tubes are called ovarials. Now the way I want you to think about this is, think of each one of those ovarials as being an assembly line within a factory. The more assembly lines that are in operation within a factory, the more can be produced. You okay with that? Okay? So what we're saying to you is, the more ovarials that are contained within the ovaries of the queen, the potentially the more eggs that can develop and be laid by her. And as we indicated, there is a positive correlation between the size of the queen, between the size of the ovaries, and the number of ovarials. Egg development begins at the very tip. Let me go back. Egg development begins at the very tip. And slowly as the egg develops, it moves slowly down the ovarial. And it completes development when it reaches the lateral oviduct here. This round structure we see is the spermatheca where the semen is stored. From the time an egg begins to form until it reaches maturity is about two days. So if a queen is going to lay 1,000 to 1,500 eggs a day, that means she's going to have to have large ovaries with a large number of ovarials uh, where the egg development is taking place. The egg is nourished and develops as it moves down the ovarial. When fully formed, it reaches the end of the ovarial, then moves through the oviduct into the vagina, which, as we say, takes about two days. <coughs> and either the egg is fertilized or not fertilized as it passes by the spermathecal duct. They have found positive correlations between the weight of the queen and the size of the brood area. They have found positive correlations between brood area and honey production, and the weight of the queen in honey production. This particular study was done by Dr. Norman Gary at the University of California, Davis. Um, heavier queens produce more brood and honey. Best time to weigh queens is when they are 12 days old and in their mating nukes. And his recommendation was, based on the study, discard between 15 to 25 percent of the lightest queens. I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting you go out and start weighing queens. But what I am suggesting is, as Roger indicated, when the queen emerges, you need to check your virgin queens to see that their wings are fully formed, but you also need to consider their size. And what we're suggesting is keep the larger ones and get rid of the small ones, okay? That's the bottom line. Heavier queens have more ovarials per ovary and thus potentially can produce more eggs. Dr. Al Dietz at the University of Georgia back in, in the 80s was able to show that queen weights are correlated with queen acceptance by workers and hence may indicate the value of a queen. So if you're not culling them, the bees are going to. Okay, so keep that, that in mind. But the heavier queens are most likely to be accepted and uh, maintained. How many ovarials should we have? Again, numerous studies have been done that have shown that ovaries contain anywhere from 130 to 186 ovarials per ovary. Queens with 300 or more, that would be 150, which is about in the middle of, of that range that we just gave you. Queens with 300 or more ovarials are to, considered to be of good quality. Over time, colony traits change due to different matings. And this needs to be considered when you're judging the queen. You're going to be looking at the brood pattern, but you're also going to be looking at, at her offspring. And you may notice, if you spend a, a fair amount of time in, in your brood nest, you may have a lot of dark work, colored workers over a period of time, and then much lighter, and then ones with more strips, et cetera. This is all related to 
this, the layer of semen that's being used at that particular time for the fertilization of eggs. Now, as the semen is pumped into the spermatheca through, through muscular action, there's a lot of mixing take place, but there's also some layering uh, as, as well. But this needs to be considered when you judge your queens. Now, let's get back to the topic at hand. We've talked about what is a high quality queen. Now, let's think about what are poor queens, and Roger's already given you many, many characteristics associated with having problems with queens. Uh, but also we want to think about what can cause you to have poor queens. And one of the biggest factors is larval age. When was that larva selected and treated as though it was ultimately going to become a queen? All right, any fertilized egg has the potential of becoming either a worker or a queen depending upon its nutrition and also depending upon the size of the cell and the orientation of the cell. Queen cells are in a vertical orientation in the hive or semi-vertical in the case of um, emergency queen cells which are modified worker cells or even some supersedure cells um, whereas worker cells have a horizontal orientation. Let's look at a study that was done by the Polish researcher at Wojcicki in, in 1971. He selected eggs, one-day-old larvae, two-day-old larvae, three-day-old larvae, and four-day-old larvae. And then provided conditions so that they, these would be raised as queens. All right? Each increase uh, in one day of age, he found there was a decrease in the body weight of the queen, in the size of the spermatheca, in the number of ovarials contained within their, their ovaries, as well as the number of spermatozoa stored within the spermatheca. And in this particular study, queens were both naturally mated and instrumentally inseminated. Okay? But the key here is decrease in body weight, size of the spermatheca, and number of ovarials. So it has a lot to do with rearing condition, but more importantly, the larval age. Now, the best queens would come from eggs. But if you graft, is the technique that you use in raising queens, grafting eggs is a no-go, or basically very difficult. So ideally then we would say if you were raising queens, we would want you to select larvae that were 18 to 24 hours old. All right, the younger, the better. Because as we said, each day of increase in age, we saw a decrease in all of these reproductive factors. Now, didn't say anything about the four-day-old larvae that he used in this study. Have any idea what happened with the four-day-old larvae? He, he, he either ended up with um, intercast, uh, an individual with some worker characteristics and some uh, queen characteristics, or he ended up with workers, okay? Ideally, ideally the point in the road from a biological standpoint where they're either going to become a queen or they become a worker is at three days, sometime during that, that three-day uh, period. Uh, but the key here is back to the idea of large queens. Reared from young larvae is what we're ideally we want to see. Queens raised from younger worker larvae exhibit higher measures of reproductive potential 
compared to queens raised from older worker larvae. This was work that was just recently uh, published in 2016. Uh, again, we've known that for years, but this particular study uh, just reinforces that, that idea. Larval nourishment, all right, it was an adequate adequate nectar or adequate honey and pollen at the time that these queens were being reared. Uh, having adequate pollen uh, is going to affect the quality and the quantity of proteinaceous jelly that the, the nurse bees are going to produce. So rearing conditions are a, a consideration. Nutritional state of the colony likewise. Inadequate starter or finisher colonies result in small cells. So small queen cells should be discarded, and as we already said, you also want to consider uh, the cell sculpturing in deciding which ones should be culled. And I guess showing this again, these would be considered nice, large, well-sculptured queen cells that you would want to keep and, and use in your operation. They have also shown that the volume and the length of the queen cell is a positive correlation with the weight of queens and with the number of ovarials. This has been found in many different studies and so this idea of large queens is extremely important. The chilling of queen cells can cause harm or rough handling of queen cells can cause harm. Queen cells placed on their sides during the pupil stage may die or the virgin queen may emerge with deformed legs or wings. Poor mating conditions can lead to, to poor quality queens. Wrong time of year. Low populations of drones. Drones flying that have been exposed to miticides and that are producing uh, semen with, with low viability. Uh, weather can interfere with, with mating conditions. Even though Roger said don't put a lot of emphasis on, emphasis on the idea of birds, dragonflies can also be a problem in, in getting queens out mated and returning uh, to their hives. It's, it's a very minor thing, but it, it's something to consider. So the her conditions during mating is also an important consideration. Low quality queens mate with significantly fewer drones, which significantly influences colony genetic diversity. And this was another study, but was done by David Tarpey and published in 2011. Low quality queens mate with significantly fewer drones. So this comes back to the idea with this, uh, this correlation between the number of spermata, spermatozoas, and the size of the spermatheca. As I already stated this, queens with sperm counts less than three million are unable to ha uh, head colonies for one season. The average queen on her mating flight will receive somewhere around 50 million spermatozoa, but the queen's spermatheca normally only contains five to seven million. And this is why I said those numbers in that Canadian study were high, because they started out at 9.7 million, okay? Typically we would say five to seven million. Well, having five to seven million, that means a queen ought to be laying fertilized eggs for at least two years. But when their longevity is shortened because of these problems that, that we're describing to you, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a minor a point now. Drones are sexually mature at approximately 12 days of age. But after they're 20 days old, their sperm count begins to go down. We can't control which drones the queens are gonna mate with. But you do not have an adequate supply of drones that have not been in contact with miticides, etc. Mating conditions are going to be uh, inferior. Shipping conditions, as I already indicated, is, is a major concern, especially temperature. You know, the postal truck pulls in, backs up to the, the um, loading dock at the post office, and the 
packages are unloaded or the queen, uh, queens are unloaded, and they may sit there on the, in the hot sun for a long period of time. So how they're being handled and how they're being shipped. This comes back to the idea that Roger was promoting. It's best if you raise your own queens. You also need to realize that there are numerous, there are numerous diseases and physiological problems that can prevent the queen from laying fertilized eggs. These could be cysts, these could be cancer-like tissues associated uh, with, with their um, reproductive tracts, etc. But there are many, many factors uh, that can cause problems and keep queens from laying fertilized eggs. So either a lack of fertilization, unsatisfactory fertilization, or exhaustion of the sperm supply stored within the spermatheca can all lead to drone layers or a queen that's unable to lay fertilized eggs. There's also pathological drone layers. So many diseases negatively impact the quality of the queen and her performance. This study was done way back in, in the 60s and the evidence was very, very strong but the, the beekeepers in the states really didn't pay much attention to it or didn't seem to be too concerned about it. Nosema disease. Of course, now we have two Nosema diseases, all right? This was with Nosema apis. The new one is Nosema sorani. And this was at a time when the Canadian border was still open, and so Bee breeders in the states were producing packages, producing queens, and shipping them to Canada. After the tracheomite, then Canada closed its border and would not allow the shipment of bees in from the states. But the important point here is packages that were coming in at that particular time, 11% of the queens had low sperm counts, 10% of the queens had nosema disease, 54% of the attendants had nosema, and 47% of the packages had nosema. Well, we've never thought about nosema having a negative impact on queens, but it does. Late packages arriving in Canada, they found that the queens had higher sperm counts, and queens that were produced in mid to late summer are best. And I suspect that would be true here uh, under English conditions as well. Early season queens, probably gonna have low populations of drones available, possibly nutrition at the time that they're being reared is, is a little less than, than desirable. You're gonna get the better queens produced during mid season. Back to this idea, what effect does Nozema have on the quality of queens? It causes a high level of supersedure. It damages the cells lining the mid and hind guts. Metabolic processes are disturbed. Ovaries receive or suffer severe damage and a high proportion of the eggs fail to hatch. She may even stop laying eggs. That was only Nozema apis. I suspect the same is true with Nozema sarani as well. And the, the latest is, it's been shown that drones can transmit viruses to queens by way of semen or during mating. And so we suspect that these viruses, and there are many different viruses now, these viruses may very well be affecting uh, queen quality. All right, I'm gonna use this summary, but then I'm gonna come back and, and directly hit the points that, that Roger was trying to make. How do you determine if you have a good queen? What cause, what allows you to get a good queen? First of all, colonies should be headed by young, vigorous queens. Secondly, select large queens. Remember, I probably should underline the word large. Select large queens, large queen cells. 
that have been reared when colony nutritional conditions are excellent and mated when large drone populations are present. Solid brood patterns, temperament, colony characteristics, and productivity are the characteristics that you should be using to judge your queens. Remember, you cannot judge a queen without a large population of bees so the queen is able to develop to her full potential. And I always like to end with this. Annually in California, we have a large queen sale where people that are going to begin raising queens will go and buy breeder queens. I personally think the best queens are your best queens. And I suspect Roger feels the same way as well. But many of our queen producers in the states will go to California and they will buy breeder queens. These are supposed to be the best, genetically, etc. And they may pay $800 for a, for a breeder queen. And they're going to, I say, raise queens and sell them from, from the queens that they buy. My point is, you could buy an $800 queen, and if you put her in a weak colony, she would look, look no better than a 50 cent queen. Okay? So it's the idea here is, if you're going to be judging your queens, you need to do it under conditions that will allow her to exhibit her full potential. Now, back to what this seminar is all about. We're having problems with queens. We're having problems with early supersedure. I reviewed a couple of studies where they have indicated potential problems associated with some of the problems that are being observed. However, we haven't totally identified the problem as far as I'm concerned or the factors that are causing it. In my mind, I talked about what the ideal rearing conditions were for the queen, the ideal mating conditions for the queen. I suspect that the queen problems that we're, we're observing, this, this early supersedure, is not a result of nutrition. It is not a result of poor rearing conditions. It is not a result of poor mating conditions. Occasionally it may be, but I'm saying I don't think that's the basis of it. I'm convinced in, in the research that I've been reviewing and that I've seen, I'm convinced diseases, viruses, Miticides are the three top issues that are affecting the quality of our queens and reducing their longevity. And with that, I'll stop, and we're going to go into a question and answer session. Do they have the same problems in countries that don't, that don't have the viromite? I'm, I'm, I was hoping by now that somebody would actually start doing some research and these are the sort of areas that I think um, uh, should be looked at first because they're the, they're, they're the easy things to do, aren't they? You know, if, it, 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 if they've got no, no varroa, um, then, then um, no, that no. could be um, uh, uh, possibly lower in the, um, the, the, the viruses. No, my side so as well. Yeah. I suspect your, your thought is exactly right. Probably countries that do not have Varroa uh, probably are not experiencing the same problems that we're currently experiencing. And as I said, I think the viruses are certainly one of the culprits. Of course, there's a direct tie with many of the viruses and Varroa mites. And so I suspect they would probably have lower problems or less problems, but I suspect they would still have some problems. Yeah. And, and of course, the, the, the mitocytes as well. You, 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 you wouldn't have them. You said that um, viruses can be transmitted in semen. Does that mean that the resulting eggs already have the virus established in, in it? That, that is definitely true. 
Uh, they're already, that's, the viruses are entering the queen's body during mating, being stored within the spermatheca, uh, and then the viruses begin to replicate and, and increase in number, and it's just a matter of a, a relatively short period of time, and we'll probably start seeing the negative effects from them. Sorry, there was a when you talk about being... miticides, are you talking about the, um, the synthetic pyrethroids, or are you also talking about the more naturally occurring ones which are used, such as oxalic acid, formic acid, and thymol? Well, hard over soft chemicals. Yeah, um, yeah, a hard, hard chemical. Yeah. The, the, most of the studies that have been done where uh, queen cells have been impregnated with uh, miticide residues, most of that work was the harder ones, the, the synthetic pyrethroids. Uh, and, you know, oxalic acid in the States is relatively new. Um, thymol has, formulations have been used for, for some time. Formic acid, it was used in Canada long before it was used in the States. Um, and we just haven't had those studies done. But it's certainly the harder miticides, yes are the ones that are causing the most significant problems. Uh, my understanding is that the Isle of Man doesn't have the vermite. That's Has right. anybody contacted um, the, the uh, Isle of Man beekeepers to I, see if they're having the same trouble? I, I've been in touch with the Isle of Man beekeepers since 2009, so nine years. Um, to the best of my knowledge, they haven't got any problems uh, in, in, in the way that we have. And going back to what Chris has said, I think that that will be one of the first places to, uh, 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 to check. Um, the uh, Isle of Man, without being unkind to them, um, because they haven't got Varroa, um, they probably tend not to look at their colonies anywhere near, near as much as uh, we do. Um, but I've been over there uh, almost on an annual basis. Um, and um, I inspect quite a lot of colonies over there and I don't see the issues that I see elsewhere. But, you know, th these are the sort of things that the researchers should be uh, looking at. Right. But for some reason, nobody wants to. Well, part of the problem is Varroa is found almost everywhere. <clears throat> so finding areas where they do not have it would yeah. be the place to start doing that type of research. Yeah. The very yes. wax that we all buy from suppliers, that's uh, also contaminated with, uh, with uh, miticide already. So uh, it's very hard, actually, to to breed from miticide-free wax, because everything's got it in. Seems that enough. way, yes. And, and you're absolutely right, but obviously we're, we're, I think we could assume, and I'm sure there's evidence to, to support it, that uh, foundation that you purchase or wax that you purchase uh, from suppliers probably has less miticides than in the colonies where you're actually treating couple times a year, etc. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we want to, want to keep the, the miticide residues as low as possible. You, you're absolutely right. To get pure beeswax now without uh, residues in is, is practically impossible. Yeah. I come from Estonia, it's quite north of uh, Europe, and we have also problems with Varro, uh, but we treat them usually in the September and October. I wonder if this is uh, something that uh, we can hope that uh, it doesn't uh, affect as much of uh, drones because they are dev developing in the springtime or does it uh, uh, affect them because we, the treatment uh, gap is quite big from September to May or something like that when they start to de develop the drone one. Seasonal timing probably is benefiting you, but beeswax acts like a sponge. And not only is it absorbing these miticide residues, it's being retained in them. So it's, it's contaminated versus uncontaminated comb. So yes, you may get some benefit from, from treating only in the fall when the drones are basically have uh, been thrown out for the winter, uh, but it's not the total answer. Um, I was a little surprised that you didn't mention pesticides and herbicides. Miticides are a type of pesticide. Oh, right. So 
I, I thought you were sort of re just referring to the stuff we put on well, our bees no. as opposed to external. Miticides are a class of uh, insecticides or pesticides uh, against mites. Uh, if you mean um, chemicals that are coming in from outside, um, uh, from the outside environment, um, that's obviously one of the suggestions that's been put forward to me. Um, I'm not going to make comment on them because I'm not qualified to do so, but I think that's one of a list of probably uh, a ten or a dozen things that perhaps the researchers really ought to be looking, uh, looking at. Um, I've got one or two uh, ideas of what the problems uh, might be, but I'm not a scientist, I'm an ordinary practical beekeeper. And, uh, uh, but go ahead and throw them out. <laughs> <laughs> well, at my age. <laughs> um, yeah, um, <clears throat> a lot of these uh, issues are really governed by, uh, by pheromones. The, the sort of things I've um, uh, mentioned, like there's absolutely no way 20 years ago you would have got emergency cells in a colony with a full laying queen. So it all of a sudden struck me that perhaps uh, pheromones being chemicals, um, we all know from our school lessons what, uh, what happens with chemical reactions, um, I was just wondering if perhaps um, chemicals that are either put into the hive or coming from uh, outside are not reacting with the pheromones in some way. Um, now this is an engineer giving you a, a sort of hypothesis, um, but uh, as I understand it, let's say queen substance has got about nine, nine chemicals, is it? Yes. Nine or twelve chemicals? Nine. Let's say it's, it's, it's that amount of one, that amount of, of, of number two, that, that amount of number three, and they're in uh, the, the, the right, um, right proportions. Let's say something, um, uh, a chemical from outside, is interfering with them and perhaps blocking one of those. Um, it might just be giving the message, a wrong message to the bees. I don't know, I might be... Uh, uh, barking up uh, an awful lot of wrong trees, but it just seemed to me, as a as a non-engineer, logical sort of person, that something like that might just be going on. And that certainly is, is a strong possibility. Uh, I'll use the example. We said for years fungin fungicides posed little threat to bees, but now they're finding that fungicides and fungicide mixes. Uh, tank mixtures, yeah. Tank mix yeah. mixtures. Cocktails. Uh, act synergistically or act together and are causing sublethal effects or even lethal effects to bees under certain conditions. And something like this could be, these chemicals coming in, as was suggested here, could be interfering with the, the pheromone profiles of, of the colony mm -hmm. as well. Take, take the situation with the, uh, the queens just suddenly disappearing. My thinking is that perhaps they're chugging along nicely. All of a sudden, something happens. Um, perhaps the, 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 the pheromone changes. Perhaps the bees don't realise um, uh, or recognise her as a queen. Don't feed her, and she starves. I don't know. I, I haven't got a clue. Uh, and I haven't yet uh, seen a queen that's dead in a colony. I've actually got one in my car. Um, but it's one that somebody else found and I, I wouldn't like to, or, or I certainly wouldn't be certain of how she died. But she was, she was found dead on the floor of a hive in about April, April or May. I was going to ask you what varroa treatments you'd recommend. I would say the softer the chemicals the better. Uh, I, my experience in the United States is oxalic acid and formic acid appear to be doing a a decent job, but I, soft as possible. Okay, yeah. I have two questions I may. You already said something about the varroa treatment um, and the, the problem the miticides cause, especially with drones and viability of sperms. Um, there is some development, especially in the United States, of developing the uh, varroa sensitive strain of hygienic bees. Um, Baton Rouge people are very busy with it and uh, are even supplying some of this uh, stock which, or some of the queens which are resistant to varroa to several queen breeders in California. Um, do you think that this, 
this type of a line will spread around the world in not too distant future, or are there uh, problems with that uh, avenue which uh, uh, the researchers go? And the second question is, uh, you said several times, the bigger the queen, the better. We haven't got a uh, luxury of Californian climate, <laughs> and uh, our springs are often very lousy. Uh, would, you, would you suggest we should always routinely supplement feeding of those colonies which are nursing the next generation of queens? All right, I'll answer the last question first. Yes, we would always, the ideal conditions for raising queens would be lots of honey, <coughs> lots of pollen, diversity of pollen, uh, very little open brood, and an extremely large nurse bee population. That will provide the ideal conditions for queen development. If that's not present, not possible, then certainly through uh, supplemental feeding, uh, that, that would certainly help the situation. Yes. Both protein and? Protein more so than, than <coughs> the honey, okay? I'm specifically thinking the protein area. Uh, back to your first question. Yes, hygienic stock is helpful in controlling, I don't want to use the word control, helping in reducing uh, varroa populations or, and lack of treatment, but it, it's, it's only one small, small <coughs> step in varroa control. Yeah. Uh, so it's not going to be sufficient <coughs> to do the job. It's, it's not the silver bullet that, that we might be looking yeah. for. We're, we're going to have a bit of a difference of opinion here, um, simply because of where, where we come from. Where Clarence comes from, um, virtually all their colonies are what we would call very prolific. They're either Italian based or probably uh, Carniolan based, something like that. Um, with, uh, with our bees, um, they're very much um, uh, le le less prolific. Um, which means that the queens don't lay the eggs, so they haven't got as many eggs going through their bodies at the same time. Therefore, they're usually smaller queens. With Italian queens, I'd say yes, so get, get the, uh, uh, they must be big. But I've had ever so many queens uh, that are big and have been drone layers, and I've had ever so many small ones that have just chugged away and chugged away and chugged away and chugged away and um, headed really productive colonies. So we've got a different sort of thing, and I think this is probably one of the issues we get with all the books or the, or, 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 or the screen, people go on the screen and read something, must be this, must be that, must be something else. California uh, is, is, is different than uh, uh, Northumberland, you know, it, it, it really is. Right. Well, a little and I bit. can't disagree with that. Yeah. Um, and I would so, say that the, the idea of size is only one parameter of many parameters that yeah. affect the quality of the queen. Yeah. I was just curious, it's just something that occurred to me again, that uh, if there's, I'm sh maybe there haven't been any studies, but just uh, the divide between uh, rural beekeepers and urbanised beekeepers, like beekeepers in cities like London, and, uh, and then the effects of uh, miticides, um, one would, you know, hope that you're not really getting that in the inner city somewhere on a rooftop hive, and uh, maybe I, it would be interesting to know uh, whether inner city uh, queens are, you know, not as unpredictable and, um, you know, prone to being not very good, the problems that you've mentioned. Um, I, I do run... Uh, well, you put your hand up in response to that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, Could, can you ask? because he, he might have the answers or, or I haven't. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I can't say whether it's the answer or not, um, but I'm, I'm the beekeeper of 12 years in Birmingham, and it would be interesting, Roger, to know um, whether during the period of time that you've been keeping bees, I assume, in a rural setting, yeah. that the, um, the biodiversity of uh, the crops and forage that's available, whether that's actually diminished, we're all, as beekeepers, well aware of monocultures and the diminishing um, hedgerows and field margins, which will be affecting um, the nutritional value uh, to the honeybee. 
In answer to the gentleman's question at the back, it's certainly something that we haven't experienced in suburban Birmingham. And I would probably put that down to the sheer variety of um, pollen that is available through, through the summer season. So I think an awful lot more uh, research needs to be done Why? in that area of, I mean, humans, for example, we're, we're all told to eat our five a day and to get that mixture. And I think it's exactly the same uh, for the bees. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I think I agree with you. But whenever I look in my colonies, um, there's a, there's a, a, a wide um, uh, a colour variation in pollen. So I don't think that's an issue. Um, certainly in my area, yes, we do get um, oil seed break. Not a great amount, but we do get... We, we, we do get some, but a lot of the farming has gone and it's, it, it's, it's going back to um, uh, sort of scrub a, a, a lot of the fields. So I don't think that's an issue. But um, it's interesting that you say you, you're not experiencing it in Birmingham. That, again, is a little bit like perhaps the, um, the Isle of Man. Perhaps it's the sort of place that the researchers could start looking at. But they, I think they, you'll find they do need an awful lot of help from beekeepers, and that I think may well be an, be an issue because everyone's got to be consistent. I would just add that keeping bees on the rooftops of buildings and things, there are different stress factors than are going to be uh, found in, in the uh, rural environment. Um, we're a local bee group and we have the benefit of the Royal Park. So for foraging, the bees go to the Royal Parks the golf courses and the local gardens and most of those don't use pesticides but perhaps the gardens do but we're having problems with rearing queens etc so they have a very broad uh, of orchards as well nearby so they have a very broad um, spectrum of foraging without pesticides and we're still having the queen problems so it sort of contributes to the discussion we're just having yeah. um, it'd be interesting to know how many people haven't had any of the problems that I've mentioned I can count them on one hand. <laughs> yeah. And I've been doing it for 55 years. <laughs> I've always had problems. <laughs> I've always had problems. But it's not a good place to rear queens. Now that's the challenge. But where I would support Roger is rear your own queens. And yes. don't bother getting any more genetic material in. We're a wash with genetic material. <laughs> 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 I, th I think it tells, tells us something. <laughs> but, um. One of my um, apprentices, bee buddy, whatever, uh, um, has now become a, a, um, an apprentice um, with Rouse, and he's doing the bees on the um, rooftops in London, and he's telling me that they requeen every year. So that... Well, yeah, do, do they do it themselves or do the bees requeen? No, they do it themselves. They requeen every year. So well, the, the, I mean, the, they, the bees do or the beekeepers? Beekeepers do. Oh, they, right. they bring in new queens every year. So yeah. really, you can discount them as, you know, yeah. in our discussion sort of thing. I've been keeping bees now for about 25 years and I haven't had the same problems that you have with queens failing. I've had queens fail obviously we all have I think but I feel that two of the really big problems with our beekeeping is well the main ones beekeepers who um, will insist on using the oldest combs they can get hold of and keep hold of them for donkey's years instead of throwing them away or, or melting them down and putting new frames in or getting new frames drawn and um, the other thing is that um, we're all frightened of spending money, um, <laughs> as though we're still getting 6D a pound for our honey and tuppence a tonne for our queen bees. And it just isn't true anymore. Um, and I think this, these are the, the two main problems that our bees actually have. Um, and on top of that, then they have varroa mites, which are infecting them with, with viruses. Um, is it possible, perhaps, that because the bees that are feeding the queens are full of viruses already. They're feeding the queens actual 
sort of more advanced virus. I, I had no idea how viruses work, really. But um, if, the, if the, 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 the worker bees that are feeding the queens are full of viruses themselves, then obviously they're going to pass those viruses on, I would think, to the queens in the food. So the queens are getting a triple hit of the STDs from the drones, the viruses that they're getting introduced to in their food, and any uh, genetic viruses that they, they get from their mums, and they are obviously not going to last very long. Um, but if people would just change their combs, then the mighty side problem disappears, more or less. If they make sure they feed their bees and look after them properly and do frequent inspections instead of thinking they can do it once a year and, and that'll be it, because that's what Grandad did, then we'd all be a, a lot happier and our bees would be a lot healthier and a lot more productive, in my opinion. I think I'm a pretty responsible beekeeper. I check my bees uh, very regularly, um, but I'm still having the problems. So I don't really think that that has got anything to do with my problems. But I do see problems elsewhere, um, and I can't speak for other, um, uh, for other beekeepers.